ready uh, ready as well. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, very good afternoon, Professor. Good afternoon, Professor Deepak. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And we are right now live in Facebook. Uh, let me have a formal introduction, then you can start with your proceeding. Uh, good afternoon to all uh, participants uh, who joined uh, in this session and also through uh, Facebook Live. I am Dr. Deepak, Associate Dean International Affairs from Savita School of Engineering. Uh, I warmly welcome all of you. Uh, today we have with us uh, the eminent personality, Dr. Mazir Nikovi. He is going to discuss on the topic, where we are we with 5G and what 6G may be. Uh, it's going to be an overview of 5G and 6G technology. Let me take the privilege in introducing Dr. Mazir Nikovi. Mazir Nikovi is a professor of telecom and mobile technologies and head of Center for Advanced Communications mobile technology and IOT at University of Sussex. From February uh, 2017 to February 2019, he was also head of Department of Engineering and Design at Sussex during which period he oversaw a uh, threefold increase in department's research funding, significant climb in league tables, successful introduction of two undergraduates programs in robotics and two new masters, including one in 5G mobile communications and the establishment of new teaching and research collaborations with China, the Middle East and Africa. Mazir sits at the EU's 5G Infrastructure Association where he advises the EC on 5G and beyond 5G strategic 
research agenda. He is also on the steering board of the EPSRC funded ComNet2 consortium in mobile technologies and US National Academy of Sciences funded research coordination network on 5G communication and networks. Prior to joining University of Sussex, he was from 2013 to 2017 a chief engineer and head of 5G research at Samsung RD UK, where he established, led, and greatly expanded Samsung's European and UK research operations in 5G infrastructure with a focus on advanced technology development and IP generation and over 40 5G standard patents. Contribution to 5G industry standards in 3G PP industry collaborations and conscious buildings, as well as working closely with Samsung's network business teams. While at Samsung, he established and successfully led a large industry led Horizon 2020 consortium, which laid the technology foundations for mobile communication systems, being able to operate in the extremely challenging millimeter wave frequency bands. From 2001 to 2013, he was with British Telecom BT Research and Technology as a senior scientist and subsequently a team leader. At BT, Mazira led and carried out research in fixed wireless communication technologies and services, including IP multicast, digital fountain, publish subscribe Wi-Fi M2M, cognitive radio, and spectrum sharing, mobile as well as advising BT's business and strategy units on wireless and wireless technology options and 4G spectrum auction strategy. From 2006 to 2010, he also held a Royal Society Industry Fellowship at University College London. While at BT, he developed in collaboration with UCL's Computational Scientist Novel Platform for massively parallel simulation of vehicular communication networks. Mazir had as a PhD in theoretical and computational physics and the M engine electrical and electronic engineering uh, from Delft University of Technology, Netherlands, with a highly successful one year research internship at Philip Research Laboratory. His PhD and subsequent postdocs at Imperial College and Queen's Mary College focused on theory and first principle simulation of quantum and classical many uh, particle systems using density function theory, quantum Monte Carlo simulation, lattice. Boltzmann simulation combined with massively parallel computing. Mazir is the author of over 120 highly cited peer reviewed papers, one best selling book, Cognitive Radio Communications and Networks, Principal and Practice, and has 13 patents in telecommunication and mobile technologies. Professor Mazir uh, has very significant experience of developing uh, and successfully leading large national and international research and innovation partnership with academia, industry, and SME. Professor Kovi is uh, sought after speaker at high level industry events, C level meetings with UK and Europe operators. He is advisor to tech funds and mobile industry on telecom technologies and investment. He is the recipient of number of awards, including BT Innovation Award, Royal Society Industry Fellowship Award, Samsung Electronics, Best Research Project of the Year Award, Samsung D. CMC Best Practice of Research Award, Professor Nikovi's research, analysis, and commentary are regularly covered in media, including New Scientist, Nature, BCC, Politico, Daily Telegraph, The Independent, FT, etc. With due respect and uh, happiness, I warmly welcome Dr. Masi Nikovi for this wonderful session. I'm sure all the participants, students, faculty members will be benefited from your talk, sir. Over to you. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, in fact, it, it's a great pleasure and honor um, to be at this uh, fantastic e conference virtually held. Um, I would have loved to be in Chennai and uh, visit you there. Um, just uh, can you uh, see my uh, slides um, and can you hear me well? Yes, sir. We can able to see the slide and also uh, listen to you. Thank you very much. So I would like to uh, thank uh, the Savito University uh, for kindly inviting me to this fantastic conference. Uh, and I'm hoping that in the future, we also be able to uh, collaborate uh, with yourself and your excellent um, faculty and university. Um, in this talk, um, I will be discussing um, 
to timeline, the current industry uh, timelines and technology of 5G. Uh, and then I will also start to discuss a little bit about what 5G uh, may be shaping up. There's a lot of interest already in this, with 5G being deployed. And uh, please feel free to um, uh, you know, let me know if you have any questions at the end. Um, so um, what I'm going to discuss is based uh, partly of our own uh, research um, at the University of Sussex and partly also on sort of collective um, research that is now being carried out uh, in Europe uh, to 5G PPP and Network 2020 uh, into sort of a 6G area. So, so this is uh, the content of my talk. I will be starting uh, just to a reminder of what 5G is actually of technology. Then I will be moving in a particular uh, application of 5G in, uh, in, in what is called now verticals. So these are new industries that 5G is uh, moving to and, and more vendors are um, highly interested. And I will highlight a little bit some uh, very recent research that we have started on uh, using 5G for localization and also social distancing. Uh, we call it smart social distancing in the COVID-19 era. Then I will be moving to some of our uh, recent research and this was carried out with Samsung uh, partly on the use of AI and machine learning for 5G and beyond 5G. Um, and finally, I will uh, discuss some of our uh, research on um, moving uh, five, uh, beyond 5G towards 6G, and in particular, the use of extremely challenging terahertz communication in order to enable terabit per second connectivity uh, by about uh, 2030. Uh, just a little bit about um, Sussex, University of Sussex, where I'm uh, based, uh, and uh, Professor Deepak has, has already visited us. So this is our campus. Uh, on the left, uh, we are based in Brighton, a, a very vibrant city, uh, just an hour from London, but also an extremely safe and green environment. Um, I'm in the School of Engineering and Informatics, uh, which is one of the 13 schools at the university. Uh, and I'm heading a center on uh, advanced communication, mobile technology, and IoT which is um, focusing on um, you know, advanced communication technologies, but also the IoT and sensor technologies uh, and new areas such as industry for all health and automotive connectivity. And more recently also uh, looking into uh, artificial intelligence and how this can be applied to communication systems. Uh, we have also a number of uh, quite a strong connection with industry partners, including Samsung, uh, Ford, Toyota, and others in the UK. Um, and we are very keen to, uh, many of our students end up also in industry. So we have very good linkage with uh, local and international industry. Uh, just to um, highlight some of our recent courses at Sussex. Uh, so, uh, this is uh, one of our very interesting uh, courses, which is engineering business management. And coming myself from engineering and business, I know that a lot of engineers would like to move to uh, sort of management. And that's a, a skill that is um, really lacking. Um, so uh, this, this course is, is done in collaboration with our business school and offer our students coming from an engineering background uh, the requirement for project management, for um, finance, for um, innovation, that then makes them very uh, ready to take management jobs in a range of uh, engineering and business uh, sectors. So, so this is uh, some of our, one of the uh, most popular uh, master students that I invite you to have a look at. Uh, then we also, as Professor Deepak mentioned, we have established a, a new master in 5G mobile communication and also intelligent embedded systems. And this is um, also has one year industry placement. And basically you do one year master and then through our contacts, you can uh, do one year placement and you may even get a job offer based on that. This is another 
cluster that I think uh, I wanted to highlight. Uh, moving on, <clears throat> well, um, we are, or most of us are now in um, academic uh, research and uh, education. Uh, but when it comes to mobile communication systems, it's important to uh, really understand where the industry is, uh, because industry can move very fast, and for academics to have an impact, it is important that where the industry, and also in case of 5G, the uh, spectrum regulations are, and how we can be ahead of them. So um, that, that's, uh, that's important. So this uh, slide summarizes in, in a nutshell, uh, the timelines for 5G uh, in terms of standardization and also spectrum regulations. So 5G is a global standard uh, and that is needed in order for your uh, smartphones to be able to roam freely when you move from Europe to India to US and elsewhere, uh, you need a global standard. Uh, and this global standard is being developed by a body called 3GPP, Third Generation Project Partnership. They meet, uh, well, before uh, COVID-19, they used to meet almost once a month in many locations. Uh, a few of these meetings was actually held in India, Bangalore, for example, where Samsung on R&D is based. Now this body basically is in charge of developing all the algorithms all the protocols that go into 5G phones and 5G infrastructure. Um, and, and, and these are the timelines of 3GP. So work on 5G started in, in release 14 of, of 3GPP around 2016. Um, me and my, my team were very much involved in this. Uh, but then the actual standard was done in 5G phase one, which is release 15 of 3GPP uh, in 2017-2018. We are now uh, in 2020, which is really 17 of um, 3GPP. Uh, so 5G phase one was mainly focusing on making 4G faster. Uh, so 4G uh, has a peak data rate, meaning that the maximum data rate that you can get from a, a 5G um, from a 4G, when you're very close to a base station, it's about one gigabit per second. Now the aim of 5G is to achieve 20 gigabit per second um, big data, so 20 times faster than 4G. And this was done in release 15. Uh, release 16 of 3GPP is mainly focusing on expanding uh, applications of mobile communication to new areas such as automotive, such as industry for all, such as health. So, so there's a lot of focus on that. So that's what we call 5G for verticals. Um, there is another body called ITU, International Telecommunication Union. The role of this body to ensure uh, that the radio spectrum for mobile communication and other systems is available globally. So this is a body where ministers of telecom typically meet as well the high level, and they decide on allocation of radio spectrum for uh, mobile, but also for satellite and for other applications. The ITU meets uh, almost every uh, four or five years in something called World Radio Conference, uh, usually held in Geneva, where they basically decide on a new spectrum allocations for new mobile communication systems. There's a of 5G. This is called IMT 2020. Uh, so, so the name for 5G uh, for, uh, is IMT 2020. Now they met in uh, WRC 19 last year and they allocated spectrum globally for 5G. Uh, so in countries such as India, for example, or UK or elsewhere, they, they, they have guidance from ITU and based on that, they, they allocate new spectrum for 5G, which is then, for example, auctioned to operators uh, and it's deployed. So this is also finalized. So we are very, very advanced with 5G already. Uh, most of the technologies are, are developed. So what are the sort of um, requirements? What are the differences between 4G and 5G? 
uh, this uh, spider diagram on the right hand side is very much used uh, and this illustrates uh, the sort of dimensions in uh, 5G, which are exceeding 4G. As you can see here on top, on the left-hand side, 5G is going to be faster than 4G, so from 1 gigabit per second peak data rate to 20 gigabit per second. But that's not the only thing that 5G is doing. It's a difference between other um, 5G and other uh, previous generation. Uh, 5G, if you look at the bottom corner, will reduce the latency on our network. That means that if I push a button on my mobile, how fast a robot somewhere else will react to that. So that's about latency, not bandwidth. We'll reduce it from 10 milliseconds to one millisecond. Uh, and that is extremely important with some of the applications I will show you. So 5G is ultra low latency. Uh, additionally, uh, 5G also enables ultra reliable communication. This is also required for many applications such as automotive, such as industry 4.0. So these are some of the uh, 5G capabilities. So latency, peak data rates and ultra reliability. Uh, here are, um, and just uh, mentioned this, that in the language of 3GP standard, uh, 5G is called 5G new radio. So NR means new radio. So that's the uh, uh, basically term for 5G radio sound. And, and, and I've listed here that you can look further. Some of this um, 5G technologies that makes it uh, enable to achieve this. One of them is that, uh, 5G will access a um, very much larger bandwidth than 4G. So um, you could, in 4G, if you look at LTE, for example, the uh, spectrum bands are divided into 10 megahertz uh, chunks. Uh, in 5G, you can uh, have up to 500 megahertz. So this is a very, very big difference. Uh, and also on the network architecture, 5G introduces things such as slicing. Slicing means that different services uh, working on a 5G network, they can entirely use their own resources. So you can have a slice for automotive, slice for uh, manufacturing, slice for health, and so on. And they are isolated in order to uh, be able to achieve requirements. So these are just a sort of a more recent um, areas that have been considered in, in uh, 5G. So 5G for uh, automotive connectivity, that's a very big area, how you uh, enable cars to be able to do self-driving and other services using 5G connectivity. 5G for manufacturing, enhancement of 5G to operate in uh, radio spectrum bands that are unlicensed. Uh, so Wi-Fi, for example, operates in this unlicensed band and 5G is going to be able to operate in those bands too. And that will reduce the cost of 5G deployment. Uh, so these are some of the areas that are now being looked at. Uh, and then uh, there are some other uh, areas such as self-organizing networks, MIMO, and something that I will focus about is the how you can use 5G technology independent of GPS uh, potentially to basically able to enable high precision localization of objects and people, both outdoor and indoor, um, and so on. But just a little bit uh, about uh, why is 5G very different from, from the previous generation, why is it so revolutionary? This is a slide from the 5G Infrastructure Association uh, that I'm a member of and advises the European Commission on 5G roadmap. Uh, the 50th of 2G, 3G, 4G, uh, the focus has been on voice, then SMS, then data and internet connectivity, but most of it was for data and entertainment applications. Now the ambition of 5G is to go beyond this, to become the network infrastructure that enables new areas, such as factories of the future. So 
5G connectivity enable uh, in factories uh, to, to machinery, to equipment to be connected. And this can be monitored and you can use that to predict the future. You can navigate the robots in the factory and so on. In the automotive, so we are now talking about connected cars using 5G uh, chipsets and modems, and not just for entertainment, but also to enable uh, cooperative uh, uh, driving and uh, self-driving and so on. The health sector, which I'm recently looking at, so we can how we use 5G to enable um, digital health and energy. So, so this is a, a new expansion 5G. It means that we need to understand the requirements from these sectors and we need to adapt our technologies, radio technologies to this new application. This is interesting because it also means there could be many jobs for telecom uh, engineers and electrical engineering in new sectors such as health, such as automotive and so on. Uh, so I advise you to keep an eye on this and our uh, university, we are a general engineering department. So our students, you know, who do telecom, they can also talk to those who do automotive, who do uh, uh, biomedical and so on. So this is a, a really expansion area for 5G. Uh, the European Commission has a 700 million euro budget to spend on 5G. Uh, and these are some of the projects that have been uh, used, uh, spend on. In phase one was focusing really on 5G um, fundamental technologies. And this was an area where I was leading uh, uh, some of the board. 5G phase two and phase three that now being uh, completed really focus on uh, verticals and also new platform on top of which you could basically deploy 5G services. So once you have the 5G connectivity, one, once you are connected to automotive, to smart cities, to hospitals, to energy sector, um, to agriculture, through 5G, and you have all this connectivity, you have all this information, how you can then develop software platforms on top of that in order to uh, make new businesses. So, so that's really uh, about that. These are some of the projects in the 5G PPP, 5G Infrastructure Association. I work on verticals. So one of the areas that they cover is automotive and transport, manufacturing, health, energy, smart cities, and robotics. It's strongly uh, supported by the European uh, Commission, and therefore we are going to see many, many of these applications. One application I worked on Quite, and it's not mentioned here, how you can actually use 5G technologies to offer uh, connectivity to rural areas or areas that bringing fiber is very difficult. Uh, here we can use uh, 5G uh, base stations in order to uh, offer a um, high data rate up to one gigabit per second broadband to areas where uh, reaching them with cable uh, or copper is, is difficult. So that's called 5G rural broadband. Uh, now, just moving on to one of these applications. So one of the areas that we have been looking at is uh, automotive. So this is a highlight of, uh, this is our campus. These are measurements that we did at uh, our campus in the, uh, uh, so this is uh, the rooftop of my uh, building. So uh, also I've been here. Uh, what we have done here is that we uh, trialed uh, how we can use uh, the 5G's uh, millimeter wave frequency, so these are high frequencies, how we can use that to create uh, high data rate, so up to gigabit per second or higher to cars. Uh, so uh, now one of the problems with uh, millimeter wave is that at these very high frequencies, they don't penetrate through the walls. They, they are obstacles such as leaves or rain and uh, cause uh, obstruction uh, and therefore the links are quite fragile. The data rate is very high. So what we have done in this project is the concept where we offer the cars dual connectivity in Wi-Fi and millimeter wave, just in case millimeter wave falls out, we can always drop back to Wi-Fi or 4G. Um, this is another example of um, some of our um, work at Sussex. 
this is uh, focusing on, on a very challenging problem. Uh, as we all know, and, and we are happy to use the GPS is, is an important technology for auto localization, all our navigations, our Google map, everything is based on GPS satellite infrastructure. When we go indoor, and a lot of things are not happening indoor, think of warehouses, think of manufacturing, think of hospitals. We like to do localization as precise or better as we do outdoor. Now that is not possible right now because that GPS has problem penetrating, it, its accuracy is not very high. And um, so what we have been working as, as, as methods, new approaches to uh, do very high precision localization, uh, and this is an example of using the uh, visible light communication uh, because at, you're at visible light, you're at very high frequencies, so small wavelengths. So you can very precisely localize uh, up to a centimeter or so. Uh, so we have been uh, developing some technologies for indoor localization. Uh, and basically what the picture shows on the right hand side, the care is that we are able to achieve centimeter um, sort of localization. And when, when then we connect this, uh, and that's our plan to 5G, we're also looking at things such as UWB, um, but the underlying network uh, that connects all of this is 5G. This is another example of um, some recent work that we are trying to progress at Sussex. Uh, as uh, uh, we have obviously the COVID-19 crisis here, the UK government decided that uh, we need to uh, end lockdown and, and people have to do uh, go to, well, for the economy, shops to open, to people are able to come out and uh, boost the economy. Uh, the issue here is that obviously if they're not socially distancing, then uh, the epidemic can, uh, can come back and have a peak. And therefore we are looking at uh, methods using the 5G localization and similar in order to be able to uh, basically uh, do this uh, social distancing, monitor it, as you can see. Now, obviously you can use camera-based approaches. So if you put a lot of cameras, then you're able to extract on the right panel, the positions, to see if social distancing is obeyed or not. Cameras are very problematic in the UK because of privacy issues. So we will be looking into using 5G and radio technologies because they won't, they won't identify people, but, but you are able still to localize them, we think. Uh, now moving on to um, yet another area, obviously artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning is really revolutionizing uh, all sectors in the uh, industry and society. Uh, and uh, I believe that AI and machine learning is also going to play a strong role, very strong role in what comes after 5G. Why is that? Because um, a lot of telecom networks, the management of them are uh, kind of manual still. So, so they are not fully automated. So AI is definitely going to play an important role in automating uh, telecom uh, networks, monitoring and management of those very complex systems. But be beside that, on a more fundamental uh, level, uh, we have been also looking at how we can use um, AI and machine learning in order to design the next generation on uh, what we call the physical layer. So, so the most important part of 5G uh, radio uh, systems um, and also the core. So, so the 5G typically consists of a radio network, a core and a, a mobile device. So how we can bo basically redesign both of these using uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And this enables us to uh, reduce, the, uh, hopefully, the basically time scale for new versions of 5G, uh, a bit more similar to what we are doing now with software, so release are much faster. And therefore you can um, offer better um, new um, technologies to new requirements on variables. I'm not going to, to go to details of this. I will uh, send a, a version of the slides with the references to the But basically, if you look, if you, uh, look inside a, a, a mobile communication modem, so that's what is your uh, devices, 
it consists of a number of signal processing units. And the aim of these signal processing units is to take uh, the data, which could be voice or video or whatever, turn it into a form that can be then transmitted over the air and then a receiver to receive it correctly. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a, in, a, in a terminal, it's called a modem. Companies such as Qualcomm, Samsung, Intel and so on make chipsets uh, that is, uh, you know, um, very uh, profitable chipsets do that, signal processing. Uh, our aim is to replace all of this signal processing with the uh, machine learning engines. Uh, in, in particular, we're using something called encoder or autoencoder. Uh, now, if we do that, and we have recently demonstrated this, that what is the uh, benefit is that you're not going to fix your uh, design, uh, but as uh, you are using your systems, uh, you receive data, and based on that learning, you're able to redesign really uh, either offline or maybe even online your um, your uh, physical layer of communication system. So, so that's an example. And what you see on the right hand panel is that when we have a scenario where we have many, many transmitter and receivers. So in a, in a busy campus, you may have many uh, interfering uh, 5G uh, base stations or a stadium. If we use this, we are able to improve greatly uh, because we are able to react in real time to interference, uh, the performance of our uh, beyond 5G systems. We have been using here, these are mainly simulations at the moment. We're looking at software defined platforms. So we have been using deep neural networks, something called autoencode in order to uh, be able to do this. This is a very early stage. Uh, so a lot of work has been done, uh, should be done, but there is a very promising area. This is an example of using AI and machine learning in uh, what we call spectrum sharing. So what is this? So uh, when it comes to 4G or 5G, uh, these systems operate on exclusive bands that are allocated to them by operators. So every operator in India or UK, they have their own band. Uh, so they are happily able to operate in these without causing interference to each other because they're separated. Now in bands such as the Wi-Fi bands or the 60 gigahertz band, the spectrum is actually shared between all devices uh, and therefore interference is a big issue. Uh, now when it comes to 5G, one of the important technologies in 5G, especially at high frequencies, is something called beamforming. Uh, what is beamforming? Uh, well, uh, if you think of a, a mobile base station, 4G or 3G, when they transmit data, they transmit it in all directions because they use only one or two antennas. In 5G, data streams are sent to each user individually using a focused beam um, of um, uh, radios. And this is enabled with multi-antenna technologies. So you're able to send beams to each user separately. Now we use this beam forming, and this is picture shows a scenario of this, in order to very precisely manage the interference uh, between users. So uh, if you do that, you can uh, greatly reduce the interference uh, combined with machine learning. And this diagram on the right hand side here, it shows uh, the result of this. So the green and red are our machine learning. Uh, the purple is when you have perfect information of all the systems, which is not possible. You can manage and plan it. So we, we obtained quite a good uh, performance using this. Um, I'm not going to go to details of this, but as I mentioned to you, 5G network typically has three components. There's the terminal, uh, the radio network, and then the core. The core is perhaps the most important part of a 5G network. This is where all the intelligence resides. This is where it decides on security, on privacy, on um, data uh, management and so on. Uh, no, so the so core really is a very big or many big computers that connect to the 5G network. Now, in the past, uh, the vendors such as Ericsson, such as Nokia, such as Samsung, such as Huawei, others, they would offer operators separate boxes uh, to do this sort of thing, such as firewalls, such as routing and so on. 
uh, we have moved now to an era with all of these functionalities can be available in the cloud. And this is called uh, SDN and NFV, Network Function Virtualization. Now, although now all of this is available as software, still uh, four networks are being manually managed. Uh, but because this is software, it is very uh, amendable to using AI and machine learning in order to be able to uh, receive data and then using an AI engine based on the data, change these functionalities as we require. So this is a, a project where we are using something called microservices um, uh, to, to do that. Um, this is actually a collaboration with my colleagues originally from India, they are in, in, uh, in Ireland, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Sashin Sharma and Dr. Avishek Nath to work with them. Um, and uh, so basically that's an, another example. So finally, I like to move a little bit to one of the candidates technologies for 6G. One of them is artificial intelligence. But the other is, is in my view is, is um, this. Uh, in order to understand this, we need to go back to the fundamentals of a communication system and in particular to Cloud Shannon developed the mathematical theory of communication in 1948, extremely revolutionary work using information theory. And in fact, the founder of information theory that is also being widely used in other areas such as physics. So what is uh, the Shannon's uh, theory in a nutshell? Uh, well, this is the Shannon, famous Shannon uh, capacity formula. Uh, and it says the capacity, so the amount of data that you can get through a channel, so it would be a wireless or a fiber channel, a noisy channel, is proportional to the B, which is the bandwidth, so how much, in our case, spectrum you have, and logarithmically proportional to this one, plus S, the uh, signal strength at the receiver, divided by the noise at the receiver. So that is a fundamental equation that is used also to plan uh, communication systems. So for example, if you're in a rural area, that will tell you, and this is, there are parts in, 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 in the UK, in Sussex where I'm, that there is no signal actually. Uh, and obviously that is because you're too far from the base station as a receiver, and therefore your signal is weak, and therefore you're not able to uh, decode. So the channel, the capacity is very low. That's one thing it says. The other thing it says that if you look at this equation, if you increase the bandwidth by a factor two, roughly speaking, because B also appears here, you will increase the capacity by a factor two. If you increase B by a factor 10, you can increase the capacity by a factor 10. Uh, that means the most straightforward forward way to increase uh, capacity of mobile wireless communication is uh, more bandwidth. You could also uh, densify the system so you can bring this base station closer to the user, have more of them. So that's called densification, but that will only logarithmically increase. So this is a most economically feasible way uh, to do it. And this is in fact what happened to 5G. So in 5G, the main reason that we are able to go from one gigabit per second to 20 gigabit per second capacity is that we are now using these very high frequencies. So these are all the frequency band allocation for 5G across the world. I will be focusing on these bands. These bands are, 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 are kind of bands that are also typically used for 4G, but these are the new bands in the 28 and 39 gigahertz uh, around that area and 24, for example, this is I, I believe would be allocated to India. These are the higher frequency bands where you have up to 500 megahertz bandwidth available for mobile communication. And therefore by moving these bands, you're able to greatly increase the capacity of our systems. Uh, so this sounds very good, but what is the catch? Uh, and this is another very important uh, technology uh, that as you go to higher frequencies, the, the, the signal uh, get uh, the loss in the signal increases uh, with the square of the frequency. So if I go from 2.4 to 24 gigahertz, uh, so 10 times higher frequency, I already have a hundred times 
loss of signal. Uh, and therefore my range becomes much shorter. But this is only true if I'm using an, uh, an antenna that is isotropic, so radiating in all direction. If I use directional antennas, so antennas that focus the beams, then I can overcome this. And this is what 5G is exactly doing. So 5G in millimeter wave uses uh, beam forming and uh, antenna arrays in order to overcome this, and it is possible. Uh, if we want to go beyond 5G, so 5G is about 20 gigabit per second. If we want to go towards terabit per second, what do we need to do? Well, the most straightforward way is to go to even higher frequencies. And that is the frequency which is known as terahertz or sub-terahertz. These are bands between 100 gigahertz to 300, 400 gigahertz, so very high. But we need to move one in order to be able to achieve terabit per second connectivity. Now, this is extremely challenging for many reasons. First of all, uh, you need uh, to be able to offer the right power. So say, uh, in order to enable that, and at terahertz, the terahertz sources being optical or electrical there at the moment are enabled to give us the right power, the amplifiers and so on. So there's a lot of challenge here, but one challenge that I'm focusing is of how we can actually focus the terahertz beam, uh, in terahertz, how we can do beam forming, how I can focus our energy in order to overcome the problem I mentioned to you. So if I go from 2.4 gigahertz to 240 gigahertz, there is a hundred times increase in frequency. That means 10,000 times uh, reduction uh, in, in the range if I use, uh, if I use uh, omnidirectional antennas. And that's why at the moment, uh, the world records for terahertz communication is maybe around a few centimeter or so. We want to move to 100 meter or more. Now, how do we solve this? Uh, well, this is just to illustrate the point. This is, uh, this is now a few years. This is Samsung's uh, 5G trials in London. Uh, so here you have a, a Samsung base station uh, operating in 28 gigahertz, beaming 5G inside. Uh, and this system is already using up to 1,024 antenna elements. Uh, they operate in millimeter waves, so you can pack them nicely, but you still need so many antenna elements maybe uh, in order to achieve a gigabit per second, uh, a gigabit data rate. So it's a huge amount of antennas. Now, if we extrapolate that to terahertz, then what we find that at 280 gigahertz, uh, we may need uh, about 100,000 antenna elements uh, for a, a 6G base station. That is uh, very scary and scale with your own issues. We have been working on alternatives to uh, uh, state of the art technology in 5G is called uh, phase array antennas or beam forming. So that is a technology where you uh, have a radio source and then you shift the phase of that using phase shifters in order to do beam forming. Now that electronically is, is, is quite complex if you go to 100,000 antenna elements. So we have been going back a bit to physics. Uh, so we are looking at uh, what is called reflect array antenna. So these are liquid crystal structures here. So they don't have any electronic part as such or not uh, um, you know, major ones. Uh, and basically by, uh, by they, this is simply by changing the phase of these uh, elements, you are able to do beam forming and electronically changing the phase of these, we are able to direct the beams in different directions. More recently, we've been also looking at a graphene uh, as a, a potential solution, uh, other than liquid crystal. So these are some examples of uh, sort of areas that we have been working and, and I think it's, it's to work. So I would like to thank you very much for your um, attention. Delighted to speak to you. Uh, and if are any questions, if time allows, I'm, I'm very happy to take. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much for uh, enlightening us and uh, showing all the updates on 5G and uh, um, beyond 5G uh, and also about 6G and various applications. 
uh before uh, moving on to the question and answer session uh, i have a quick question popping up in my mind uh, okay. so you showed graphene at the end so we were also working on graphene based polymers graphene based antennas so how how far is the research on graphene based antennas and uh, how much productive it has been so far um Yes, uh, so um, we we have been working on this actually very very recently, uh, the last last three months. Um, uh, it's one of my PhD students who actually did his uh, master at Imperial with John Pendry on uh, uh, metal materials, uh, and we are getting some uh, reasonably promising results. Uh, we have difficulties really get the phase shift that is required with graphing at the moment. As compared to liquid crystals, so we are now looking at how we can actually get this phase shift difference with graphene structure. So it's ongoing, but uh, okay. yeah, we well, well, very promising um, uh, area uh, because um, there are also work going on using uh, plasmonics in graphene to uh, use as a source for terahertz. Okay. So if you combine the two, it might be very very interesting, and I know. But you're doing excellent work in that area, so I'm very happy to discuss that. Thank you. Let's move on to the question and answer session. Like it is now, the forum is open. Uh, faculties, participants, if anybody is interested, uh, like if you want to ask a few questions, you can ask now. Professor will be happy. Hello, to sir. Address. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Please introduce sir? about yourself and then ask. Yeah. Yeah. This is Shobna, sir, assistant professor in the department of ECE. Yes, sir. Can I ask a question? Of course, yes, please. Yeah, yeah, sir. I just wanted to know what are the security threats or privacy threats that might arise in five G or six G, and what are the ways in order to overcome that? Uh, th that's an excellent question, and that's one of the questions actually we are asking ourselves now when we are looking at the social five G. Yes, sir. There are, there are many, um, so 5G uh, has some uh, security issues uh, in the link between the terminal and so we saw some security threats. These have been now sorted out. Uh, but given the complexity of uh, architectural side of 5G, slicing and also because 5G is being used to, you know, for uh, self-driving calls and other applications, uh, there are still uh, issues to be addressed. Uh, so it's a very fertile area, 5G security. One area that for me is very interesting is that um, through 5G, you're also going to connect to a lot of IoT devices. Uh, and these IoT devices security is not, um, is very different from 5G. So you may have a security, uh, sort of a, a Trojan horse and other, uh, uh, cases of basically, although the 5G network itself is secure, but when it connects to the IoT, uh, may, may lead to some um, vulnerabilities. So I think that's a very interesting area. Uh, in terms of privacy, um, I, I guess that is something that is also interesting when, uh, so I know, for example, in China, one of the key applications of 5G is for face recognition and, and Identification. So I think that's sort of a, quite a huge area. Uh, how you can deal with that? I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. It was such an You're inter very, informative very, session, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Any anybody else? Any other? Uh, good good evening, professor. Myself, for Dr. P. Kalyanasundaram from Department of ECE. Uh, Hello. Actually, I have a. Uh, uh, professor, do you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, Professor. Actually, uh, as far as IT is concerned, is there any possibility of uh, reallocating the frequencies? Because as per uh, your information, I came to know that 5G and beyond, we are going to make use of 2 to 2 point, uh, 24 gigahertz. In such cases, uh, is there any possibility of reallocating? Uh, beyond uh, 108, that is 108 megahertz after a pre uh, FM broadcasting band, the air band has been occupied uh, by some other stations, commercial stations. Because why I have a doubt is, 
I am ham radio operator. I am operating on the frequency of 144 to 146. Some of the commercial station has been uh, encroached uh, the same frequencies, and uh, some of the fishermen also given the rights to operate on such frequencies. So my doubt is, is there any uh, idea of allocating the frequency once again by ITU processor? Uh, so which frequency is that? Uh, in India, they are encroaching the frequency 144 to 146. Even it has been allocated to uh, the fishermen as well as other commercial stations. Is that the megahertz or the gigahertz? Megahertz, megahertz. Oh, okay, okay, In I see. In VHF band. In VHF band. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I mean, um, I didn't really went through detail details of this, but basically, 5G bands are roughly divided into three: the the low band, which is at the moment 600 megahertz, 700. The mid band and the high band. The low band are extremely interesting for IoT applications uh, because of the uh, data rates are low, but they have very good penetration in the round or two. And, um, and um, in fact, that is being allocated now for what is called 5G light uh, continuation of narrow band IoT. So I would say if there are uh, opportunities for uh, band being allocated in this sort of 140. Megahertz that will be extremely welcoming for operators to run things like a smart metering on smart cities, that sort of applications. Extremely attractive, I think. Don't know if that answers your question. Okay, okay thank you, Professor. That's why I had a doubt. Yeah, because, in in uh, UK it hasn't happened, but you know we we got the 600 megahertz, which is uh, 700. Yeah. Even for uh, ham radio operators itself, they are extending the frequency to 50 hertz band also. That's why I had a doubt, Professor. Thank you, Professor. You're very welcome. Any other participants? Anybody else? If you have doubt, you can ask me. Okay. Uh, I will also share Professor's mail ID with all of the participants. So, in case if you have any clarifications, you can also mail. Professor, and I'll request Professor to answer your question. Sure, I'll be delighted. And, and thank you yeah. very much once again. Thank you for thank inviting you, Dr. me. Thank you, Doctor Mazir, and uh, it was really a pleasure and having a, a you here. Conference. And uh, this is yes, and uh, immediately you accepted uh, our uh, request uh, to join the conference. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day ahead. Yeah, and thank you. Yeah, bye now. Thank you. Bye bye. Good day. Bye. So with this, we we are coming to the end of the session uh, keynote session two. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you. Ma'am, Radhi, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yeah, please uh, come offline, ma'am. Like we can come.